Good morning, church. How are we feeling this morning? Great. Good to have you here. Uh, my name is Matt Mizell. I'm the lead pastor here at Pinion Hills Community Church. It's good to have you here with us as we wrap up this series called Love and War. The last couple of weeks we've been talking about how do we have godly relationships that are worth fighting for. Two weeks ago we talked specifically about marriage. How do you create a real godly marriage that, that God intended us to experience if we get married? Last week we talked about relationships and how to prepare our hearts for that type of marriage. Whether you're dating or engaged or single right now, how can you best prepare yourself for the type of love that God has has created for you. Well, today, we've already talked about love. Today, we're talking about the war. Now, before we get into it, I do want to give a disclaimer. Some of the content that we're going to be talking about today may be a little bit too sensitive for younger ears, so we are rating today's message PH13 instead of PG13. Uh, so if you happen to have kids here that are uh, 13 years old or younger, you might consider checking them into our kids' ministry. The content there is, is tailored for kids as opposed to what we're going to be talking about. Your call, it might just lead to a conversation that you might not be ready for, but that's totally up to you. Use your discretion uh, as parents, and, and you've just been forewarned. That being said, uh, I also want to give a shout out to all the firefighters and fire station number six who are watching right now on the live stream. Uh, thank you for protecting us. I know you can't come here to church and physically be here, yet you're having church in the fire station right now. So can you give them a round of applause? Welcome them. Good to have you with us. It is also my understanding that we have some Olympic athletes here with us this morning. If there's anybody that has competed in the Special Olympics in Farmington, will you please stand so we can, we can acknowledge you? There's some guys up here in the front. <laughs> Thanks, fellas. You brought your gold medals, your bronze medals. We are, are thankful that you've cho chose to join us here at Pinion Hills the day after you guys are winning medals in the Olympics. That's really, really exciting. All right, so, so let's jump on in. Where we're going to start today is, is related to relationships. Now, to be honest with you, oftentimes we are our hardest critic when it comes to relationships. In fact, oftentimes we are the most dangerous people when it comes to our own lives and our own relationships. I don't know if you've heard about this before, but uh, in the country of India... And, and in Afghanistan and in many other countries throughout the Middle East, it's common for them after a wedding ceremony to pull out guns and shoot guns in the air in celebration of the couple that just got married. Now, it sounds like crazy, da -da 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 -da, people shooting off guns, but in 1985, there was this group, these people, this couple got married, they all started shooting off guns. Well, what goes up must come down. And the bullets all came back down on the wedding, the ceremony, the reception. And one of those bullets, unfortunately, tragically killed somebody at that particular wedding. Now, you would think, I would make the presumption that if bullets come down and somebody dies in a wedding, we'd simply stop shooting guns at weddings. But they haven't done that. In, in fact, since 1985, throughout Middle Eastern countries, there have been 118 documented deaths at weddings because they keep firing off guns because they're like, yeah, we love love and we're willing to die for it, yeah. It's kind of crazy, but it's very dangerous. Moral of the story, if you happen to be planning on getting married in the Middle East, perhaps bring a helmet with you because it's dangerous getting, getting married there. Uh, I read about a couple recently that they were kind of daredevils. They liked living on the edge, literally, and they would go all, all sorts of different places. There's a picture of them. They would take pictures and selfies. They would set up a tripod and set it up so they could take a picture of themselves, and they would do this at Yosemite. They'd do this at the Grand Canyon all over the place. Well, unfortunately, this particular selfie is the last selfie that this couple took because a gust of wind literally blew them off the mountain. And later on, somebody found the tripod in the camera and realized the couple is at the bottom of a thousand foot ravine underneath there. They fell to their deaths. Now, you might think that that's a very rare occurrence. Crazy enough, it's not. Since 2011, since they've been documenting <laughs> selfies, there have been over 250 selfie-related deaths while people are taking pictures and not realizing the danger that's right there with them. Moral of the story, when you're taking selfies, be very careful of, of what's going on around you. There's another couple that I, that I came across recently. They apparently got married on a spider web over a gorge in Utah. Now, these people are really into slacklining. What a slackline is, it's kind of like a, a tightrope. It's about two inches wide, and, and they can walk on it. But in this particular wedding, you can see all the friends and the family that are smart, that are standing off on the side. But they convinced a pastor to go out there on this slack line, and then the, the, the groom comes out, and then the bride comes out, and they, I do, you do, we do, hootie, hoo, yay, all that. If you're into slacklining, 
There is zero chance you're going to convince me to come and officiate your wedding <laughs> above like the Grand Canyon, like standing on a spider web or something. Like there's no way I'm going to possibly do that. But apparently in this wedding, they didn't want to walk across the slack line on the way out. So as soon as they exchanged their vows, the groom picked up his bride and jumped. No, no, they didn't die. They didn't jump to their deaths. They were strapped in with a bungee cord, but they bungeed out. That was the recessional, was a bungee recessional. And then they landed and they were all over the news after this. Everybody's talking about their particular wedding. Just a few days ago, there's another couple. A few days ago, a couple went hiking in, in, uh, in Zion National Park. And as they went out in Na Zion National Park, they were so far away from cell phone service. This is a picture of the couple. They're about four hours away from cell phone service when the bride, she fell into quicksand. So the groom, thinking quickly, pulls her out, but while he's pulling her out, he gets trapped in the quicksand, and she couldn't pull him out. So after trying to get her husband out of this quicksand, she had no option except for to go for help. She hiked four hours back out to get a, a cell phone service where she called 911. They brought a helicopter over, and 11 hours later, they pulled this guy out of the quicksand, and he was still alive. All that being said, sometimes we put ourselves in the most dangerous positions when it comes to relationships. Now, you might be sitting here thinking, well, I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to hike in Zion and go step in quicksand somewhere. I'm not going to go and like put myself on a spider web in the middle of the Grand Canyon. I'm not going to be shooting guns off at people's weddings. So I think I'm okay. You might have that perspective. However, I want to caution you because we have an enemy that wants to convince you to sabotage your own relationships. Our enemy has a plan for your life, and it's to destroy your life. Consider this quote about our enemy. Somebody said this, anonymous quote, God has a plan for your life, but the enemy has a plan for your life. Be ready for both. Just be wise enough to know which one to battle and which one to embrace. The enemy's got a plan for your life, so does God. We see this in, in John 10.10. 10. <coughs> Jesus says this, he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the, have it to the full. Here you see this dichotomy. You see this contradiction. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. The enemy's got a plan for your life. But Jesus says, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. But notice about this enemy. The enemy, he's stealing, killing, and destroying. But he's not, he's not forcing you to do anything. The enemy can't make you do anything. Now sometimes People get confused because you'll hear people say things like, well, the, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. Your stupidity made you do it. <laughs> the devil doesn't make us do anything. He doesn't force you to do anything. Sometimes I, I believe that people give too much credit where credit isn't due. The enemy can't force your hand. He can't make you do anything. Now, God... God is described throughout scripture as having incredible power. In fact, he's referred to as being omnipotent. Here's what omnipotent means. Omnipotent, omnipotent means uh, omni is Latin for all, and potent means powerful. And so omni, omnipotent, combining those two words, all powerful. God has unlimited power. Our enemy, Satan, does not. He is a created entity. He's a created being. He doesn't, he doesn't just have all the opposite powers of God. He doesn't have all the power in the world. God is all-powerful. He has unlimited power. Our enemy isn't on the same level as God. There's another term, a kind of a churchy term that's used to describe God. It's omnipresent. Omni, again, meaning all, all-present. God is present everywhere. God has the ability to be everywhere at all times. Satan, our enemy, does not have that ability. Now, perhaps if Satan were to go, like, to the four corners, <laughs> where he's literally standing on the, the corner of Colorado and Utah and Arizona and New Mexico, he could be like, hey, look, I'm in more than one place at one time. But that doesn't make him omnipresent any more than you and I would, would be omnipresent. He can't be in more than one place at one time. He doesn't have the same capabilities of God. We can't continue to give him credit where credit isn't due. We are sometimes usually in the decision. We're, we're in the place where we're making our own call, making our own decisions. Now, that being said, Satan is not om omnipotent. He's not omnipresent, but the Bible does describe our enemy in a variety of, of words. Here's some of the words that describe our enemy. In the Revelation, 9, Revelation chapter 9, verse 11, he's referred to as Apollyon, which means destroyer. In Revelation 12, 10, he's referred to as the accuser. In the book of 1 Peter, he's ca called the adversary. Revelation 12, 9, he's the deceiver. In Matthew 13, 19, he's referred to as the evil one. In John 8, referred to as the father of lies. And in Matthew 4, referred to as the tempter. 
These are all words, descriptive characteristics that describe our enemy. He's not omnipotent. He's not all-knowing. He's not all-present. He's not omnipresent. However, he is a master manipulator. He's a master deceiver. And he's doing everything he can to steal, kill, and destroy you and I. He wants to take us out. He wants to derail our relationships. So the question is, how do we fight against that type of enemy? How do we engage in a battle against that type of enemy? And here's the answer to that question. If you can determine the strategies that the enemy is going to use against you, you can determine the strategies you're going to use against him. I'll say that again. If you can determine the strategy being used against you from the enemy, you can develop your own strategy to battle against the person who's coming after you, the enemy who's coming after you. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians 6. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord in his mighty power, God's mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul is making the argument, like it or not, you and I are in a war. Like it or not, you and I are in a battle. The enemy is coming after us. He's doing everything he can to possibly, everything he possibly can to take us out, to shoot uh, these arrows after us, which is why we see in 16, Paul says this to, to Ephesians. He says, take up the shield of faith, which you can use to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Our enemy is trying to, to get at you. He's trying to get at me. And he wants to do everything he can to sabotage, to destroy what God wants us to experience. He does not want you to have a godly relationship. Everything we've talked about in week one of the series and week two of the series, he doesn't want you to engage in any of that. He wants to derail you. He wants to destroy you. According to Ephesians 6.16, He's going to shoot flaming arrows after you. So if we can understand what are these arrows being shot at us, it will give us a better understanding as far as how we guard and shield against that. So in our time this morning, I want to talk about four of the most common flaming arrows that the enemy is shooting towards you and I. Now, this isn't an all-inclusive list. There's perhaps thousands, if not millions, of arrows that the enemy could shoot towards us to cause harm and destruction. But the, these are the four most common, four of the common arrows that the enemy is using against you and I. Here's the first one. The arrow of confusion. If you're taking notes this morning, you can write this down in your notes. The arrow of confusion. The enemy wants to convince you what is right is wrong. What is left is right. What is up is down. What is black is white. He wants to create confusion in you so you don't know what the truth is. And here's the reason why. If he can create confusion, if he can confuse you, he can corrupt you. If the enemy can confuse you, he can corrupt you, which is why Paul gives a warning in Galatians chapter 1. He says, I'm astonished. He's speaking to people who have gotten confused. I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ, and you're turning to a different gospel. And then he clarifies in verse 6, it's really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion, and they're trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. The enemy wants to confuse us. He wants us to not understand what real truth is. So in the Bible, God says things like, love is patient. But then the enemy will whisper things in your ear like, ah, have fun now. You can be patient later. That's a mixed signal. God's message is different than what the enemy's message is trying to convince you to believe. God will say this. He says, love is kind. But then, then the enemy whispers in your ear, well, yeah, but you deserve to hold a grudge. If somebody comes after you, you deserve to get back at them, make them feel the pain. The Bible says love does not envy, but then the enemy says, don't you wish your girlfriend was hot like me? <laughs> Maybe not that exact temptation. Here's what creates confusion in our lives. When we're listening to God and the enemy at the same time, that creates confusion. Because we're like, who do we listen to? Who's right? Let me remind you, God is not a God of confusion. We see in 1 Corinthians, God's not a God of confusion, but of peace. God doesn't cause confusion. He doesn't want you to be confused, which is why Jesus says in John 14, 6, he says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. He wants us to trust him and have faith that God has the truth. So how do we fight against this particular error, the error of confusion, where we have to keep coming back to God's truth, come back to God's truth, come back to his truth, come back to his word. 
And there's three quick steps that, uh, or, or three things that you can, you can do with the truth. It's, it's this to, uh, to combat against this particular arrow. Know the truth, trust the truth, and apply the truth. That combats against the arrow of confusion. The enemy is going to do everything he possibly can to try to get at you, but if you know the truth, you trust the truth, and you apply the truth, that arrow of confusion won't get past your shield of faith. That's the first arrow. The second arrow is this, the arrow of comparison. The arrow of comparison. The enemy wants you, wants to convince you that the, the grass is greener over there. Even though perhaps you've walked down the aisle, you've exchanged I do's, you've made a statement saying, till death do us part, the enemy wants to convince you, no, 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 you, you married the wrong person. Now, there's 7 billion people worldwide. Some people will be like, well, I think God makes one person for you, whether you believe that or not. The reality is that when you walk down the aisle and you exchange vows, that's the person, that's the one, that's the person you're supposed to be with. But the enemy will come and whisper in your, your ear, he's like, no, nah, but, but look at that girl. Look at the way she cooks. Look at the way he looks. Look, look at how young this other person is. And you're comparing what you have to what you don't. And you have to guard against this particular arrow of comparison because the enemy wants to come after you and, and try to convince you that what you have is not good enough. That you made a mistake. You married the wrong person. You should have married that person or that person or that person. The grass is greener elsewhere. We've got to guard against that. Proverbs, in Proverbs 4.23, Solomon said this. He said, above all else... Guard your what? Heart. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. The enemy is, is pulling out the arrow from his quiver and he's shooting after your heart with the, the arrow of comparison, hoping that he can, he can hit you, hoping that he can convince you the grass is greener elsewhere. He wants to confuse you. He wants you to compare your relationships. And if he does, if he succeeds in either one of those things, he's going to pull out another arrow and shoot this third arrow, the arrow of compromise. The arrow of compromise. He wants to convince you that this little thing, this little decision, isn't that bad. And he wants you to compromise here and here and here and here and here. And after a while, you get way over here. And you're like, how did I get here when I was over here? How, how did that journey take place? Dr. James Dobson wrote a book called Love Must Be Tough. And inside his book, he talks about what he calls the, the anatomy of an affair. And he says, somebody that's in a married relationship, they could have zero intention of getting into an affair. But if somebody were to write them a letter or a Facebook message or an Instagram or a Snapchat or a text message or whatever it may be, if somebody were to confess their love who's not their spouse, if somebody else says, hey, I like you or I'm infatuated with you or I love you or whatever, somebody that's in the married relationship that receives that letter, they go from zero intentionality of being into an affair and they skyrocket to a 90% likelihood of getting into an affair. Zero to 90 like that. Now Why? Why is that the case? Dobson goes on and talks about it in his book. He says it's because oftentimes in, in married relationships, there's unmet needs. Sometimes the husband or the wife, they're not doing uh, everything they can to support and serve the other person. And when there's unmet needs, when some other person comes in and says, hey, I'm infatuated or I like you, it's oftentimes not even the intentionality of somebody to get into an affair. But, but they're like, well, this person, maybe this person will meet the unmet need that my spouse isn't meeting. Maybe the intentionality is, I just want somebody to listen to me. I just want somebody to, to hear my stories. I want somebody to feel like, like they care about me. And they go to this other person for an emotional connection. It's not even intending to create an, an affair, but there's an emotional connection that takes place. And oftentimes it's that emotional affair that begins to take place that leads to a physical affair. And before you know it, you're, you're in a full-on sexual affair. There's, a, there's a, somebody who wrote on this particular subject, Joyce Martyr, licensed counselor. She was quoted in the Ch Ch Chicago Tribune. She said this. She said, social media seems to have added fuel to the fire of infidelity. Former flames are just a click away. Appropriate relationship boundaries can become blurry. For example, when does, a casual, when does casual messaging cross the line into an emotional affair? It's a good question. When does casual messaging on Facebook, on Snapchat, on whatever, cross the line and become an emotional affair? When do casual conversations with your secretary cross the line into an emotional affair? With your coworker, with your friend's spouse? When does a casual, innocent conversation go too far? We have to protect ourselves against that. We have to prevent the enemy getting a foothold in our relationships and the way that we do this is we, we serve our spouse 
We try to make sure that there's no unmet needs by serving them and serving them and serving them, putting their needs above our own. Which is why Paul gave the warning in 1 Corinthians 7, 5 to married couples. Here's what he said to married couples. He said, do not deprive each other from sexual relations. Don't deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both have agreed to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Married couples, if you're refraining, if one or both of you is refraining for whatever reason because of apathy, laziness, selfishness, perhaps revenge because you're like, well, my spouse did this to me and I want them to feel the pain and I'm, I'm not going to sleep with them until they make things right. If you're getting revenge on them, you're giving them a foothold. Maybe it's just you're too tired. You've got a headache all the time. You're giving the enemy a foothold in your relationship. Now, I'm not giving license for somebody that's not getting intimacy in the relationship. I'm not giving you permission to go and have an affair and, and go fill that need somewhere else. So don't misuse my words. But for those of you who are refraining from including sex in your marriage, for whatever reason, whatever excuse, whatever justification you've come up with, you're providing an unnecessary temptation in your marriage. And all the men said, amen. <laughs> Dr. Vincent wrote this in Christian Medical Society's journal. He said, a sure way to prevent an affair is for a husband and wife to both put the other's needs ahead of their own. A sure way to prevent an affair is for the husband to serve his wife and his wife to serve the husband and put their needs above their own needs and say, I am here to serve you, to love you. There will be no unmet needs in this marriage because I'm going to serve you to the best of my ability. That's how you prevent an affair. We have to guard ourselves against this particular arrow, the arrow of compromise. Solomon said this in Proverbs 25, 28. He said, a person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. When you're serving your spouse, you're building up their self-control. You're helping them succeed and helping them not go down the path of temptation. And, and a city without walls, what, what is a city without walls? Anybody comes in, anybody goes out. There's no defense. We need to have boundaries because the, arrow, the arrows of the enemy, they're coming after us. They're flying after us. The enemy wants to do everything he can to get inside your relationship and cause havoc. We cannot allow that. We can't allow these arrows that we're talking about, the arrows of confusion, the arrows of comparison, and the arrow of compromise. Now, perhaps this morning I could talk about a thousand or a million other arrows, but there's one particular arrow that I think is causing a lot of destruction that I want to address before we leave our time together, which is the arrow of counterfeit. The arrow of counterfeit, specifically counterfeit love. Several years ago, I was working at my parents' restaurant. Um, it's kind of like a, a version of Chick-fil-A. It was in Cottonwood Mall on the west side of Albuquerque. And I'm, I'm working in my parents' restaurant. Uh, it's a little fast food place in the food court. And there's a person that comes up and gives me a $10 bill and orders a, a menu item. So I give them the food, but I'm putting the $10 bill away in the register. And I realize this feels funny. And I'm looking at it, it looks like a $10 bill. On the front, flip it over, it looks like a $10 bill in the back, but it just, fe it feels like normal computer paper. And I was like, I think I just got duped. I think somebody gave me a fake $10 bill. So I went back to the back of the restaurant. I called the local police. I was like, hey, I don't know really who to call or what to do, but I think somebody gave me a fake $10 bill. Do you guys like investigate that? Do you care at all like that I got a fake dollar bill? And they're like, uh, we'll get back to you. And I don't know if you know this, um, but when you call the police for a fake counterfeit dollar bill, guess who doesn't show up? The police. When you call the police, if you receive a $10 bill or whatever, fake dollar bill, police ain't going to show up. You know who does show up? The Secret Service shows up. I thought the popo were going to show up, but no, the Secret Service show up outside of my parents' little restaurant. There were, you know, black suits and everything. I didn't realize, you know, a lot of people have the assumption that the Secret Service, they only protect the president. They only protect POTUS, the president of the United States, and they do that. But there's 6,000, over 6,000 Secret Service agents throughout the United States, and they also protect the treasury, which includes the money, the dollars, the coins that represent the treasury. And so... Here, Secret Service shows up outside of my parents' little restaurant in Cottonwood Mall in their, you know, suits, ties, little ear things. And I'm like, what's up? <laughs> and they're like, hey, do you by chance have any, like, video cameras? Did you capture the person that gave you the $10 bill? Do you have any sort of pictures or anything that you could show us who it was? And I was like, no, we don't have security cameras. We don't have anything, like, monitoring. But they're right there still eating the food that I gave them in the food court. 
So Secret Service walks over there, they stand the person up, they put cuffs on them, and they whisk them away. And you might be thinking, well, wow, I, I can photocopy money and perhaps get away with it. No, don't do that. If you do get busted and get caught counterfeiting money, creating fake money, the, the fine is up to $250,000 or 20 years in prison. It's a significant deal to create counterfeit money. Now, I understand that the enemy perhaps may not be tugging on your heart right now, trying to convince you and tempt you to make fake dollar bills when you leave here. However, I do believe that the enemy is coming after countless people with the idea of counterfeit love. Specifically, what I'm referring to is pornography. Pornography is a cheap alternative to real relationships. It's not what God intended, it's not what God wants, and it's a counterfeit variation of a relationship that's not real. Now, you, you might even, just with me saying that, you might have just tuned me out and be like, ah, oh, it's not applicable to me. I don't struggle with porn. I don't have an addiction to porn. I don't know anybody that does. Here's the sad reality, is that even if you don't personally struggle with porn, I can guarantee somebody you know does. They're addicted, they're struggling, they feel like they're drowning, and I can say that with confidence based on some of the statistics that we see regarding the porn industry. Look at this. Porn sites receive more regular traffic <coughs> than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined every day. That's a lot of traffic. A lot of people going on to Netflix and Netflix binging and people buying everything on Amazon. In fact, let me just inform a poll. Who here uses Netflix? Anybody have Netflix? Okay, quite a few. Who here uses Amazon? Anybody use Amazon? Quite a few. Anybody use Twitter? Five of you, okay. <laughs> Taking all five of you from Twitter plus the other 500 of you from Amazon and Netflix, if you, if you go across the entire United States and add up all those numbers to realize how many people are engaged in pornographic websites is insane. Think about this next, next statistic. 35% of all internet downloads are porn related. Third, that's over one-third of everything downloaded on the entire internet relates to the porn industry. What about this statistic? Did you know that the porn industry generates more annual revenue than the National Football League, Major League Baseball, and National Hockey League combined? You take all the apparel sales, all the hats, all the tickets, all the food that's bought in the stadiums and the Super Bowl, when you see on Monday Night Football, you see all the people, the thousands, 80,000 people on a stand, and think all the money that's, that's poured into these professional sports, to think that the porn industry eclipses the revenue generated from all those professional sports combined. This is a huge issue. And unfortunately, it leads to this fourth statistic. You're 300% more likely to have an affair if you use porn. 300% more likely to have an affair if you're engaging with porn. This is a sad reality. The enemy is shooting these arrows of counterfeit love, and they're hitting people over and over and over. Perhaps the most sickening statistic I have for you this morning is this. 34% of all internet users have been exposed to unwanted porn via ads and pop-ups, etc. That means if you've you got kids and they have access to the internet, there's a good chance they've seen porn whether they wanted to or not. 34% of adults that say, you know, I don't want this to be a part of my life, I don't want porn in my life at all, are still seeing porn and in engaging in it even though they don't want to. It's unwanted. This is a huge issue and we have to, we have to guard our hearts, guard our minds, guard our eyes from what we're engaging in. There's a story in the, in the book of Proverbs where there's a guy who's inside his house and he's looking out onto the street and, and describing a scenario that's taking place that, that is similar to what, what the porn industry looks like. Follow along with me. Proverbs chapter 7, 6 through 23 is where the story is. This guy says, At the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice. He's looking through his window out into the street. I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who had no sense. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house at twilight. As the day was fading, as the dark of night was setting in, then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute with crafty intent. She is unruly and defiant. Her feet never stay at home. Now in the street, now in the squares, and at every corner she lurks. How much does this sound like the porn industry? Like, it used to be that you had to go and find porn. Now it's just everywhere that you look, it's at people's fingertips right on their smartphones. Continues on in the story in verse 13. 
This woman took a hold of the man, hold of the youth, and kissed him with a brazen face. Brazen means confident and bold. (laughs) With a brazen and confident face, she said, today I fulfilled my vows. She's even twisting the truth. She's trying to make it sound like this, this event that's about to take place is okay. I fulfilled my vows, and I have food for my fellowship offering at home. So I came out to meet you, and I looked for you, and I found you. I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deeply of love until morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. My husband's not home. He has gone away on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money and will not be home until full moon. And in verse 21, here's how it impacted the youth. With persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. In verse 22, all at once he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose, till an arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. Friends, porn is ruining people's lives. And this isn't just for the men in the room. The fastest growing demographic for porn usage is women. This is affecting millions of people, many people even within this room. Now you might have said, if you're somebody that engages with porn, you use porn, you you might have made the justification, well it doesn't hurt anybody, not affecting anybody. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's a lie that the enemy's trying to convince you of. Because the counterfeit relationships that porn is, is eroding away the real intimacy that you would experience. Counterfeit relationships like porn, it's, it's eroding away authenticity that you could have with a real person. It's destroying real relationships. It's destroying who you are. There's so much guilt and shame associated with it. It's getting inside your mind, inside your heart. It's destroying you and the people who are precious to you. Don't tell me it doesn't hurt anybody, it doesn't harm anybody. It's destroying everybody that's precious to you. And aside from that, all the people that are engaged in the porn industry, they're only engaged in it because of the supply and demand curve. If there wasn't a demand, there wouldn't be the supply. But did you know that people are being recruited left and right into the porn industry because there's a shortage of people to be in it because of the demand is so high? Did you know that the average person, the average age of the person that's recruited into the porn industry, the sex trafficking industry, is 14 years old? Our kids are being seduced to be brought into this industry that is a sickening, vile industry based on demand from adults. How sad. Don't tell me it doesn't hurt anybody. You're ruining relationships. You're taking little boys, little girls out of their families and they're being promised big money. They're being promised families that care for them when they're being thrown into this industry that is horrible. And once they're in, it's so hard to get back out based on threats, based on saying we're going to kill you and your family if you try to get out of this industry. It is a horrific, horrific industry that is being fueled because it doesn't hurt anybody. We cannot lower the shield and lower our guards and say, that arrow is okay. That counterfeit love, come on, bring it on. And we can't, we can't accept that and, and let our bodies get riddled and be pierced because what's happening is that we are being destroyed from the inside out. 1 John 2.16 The Bible says this, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. We've got to guard against this, which is why just this last week, I've I've been working for the last couple of years writing a book called The 31-Day Challenge, which provides a daily battle plan for people who are struggling or addicted to porn provides a daily battle plan for them to be freed from porn. From porn. Now, people that are addicted, they're, when, when they're addicted to substances or alcohol or whatever, to say, I'm going to quit for a month, that's a big statement. And most people won't even try because that's too hard. But to say, okay, I'm not going to engage in porn today, that's possible. And that's what my book, it just came out this week. In fact, it just got launched on Kindle this morning. There's a few copies in the bookstore. You can go get a copy if you want. If we run out of copies, you can put your name on a wait list and we'll get more copies uh, to come in. But basically, it takes 31 days. Here's your challenge today. Here's your battle. Here's a battle plan for today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Focus on today. And when tomorrow comes, win this battle. And the next day comes, win this battle. Gives a battle plan for how to to get away from the enemy. How to fight against this enemy who is shooting arrows of counterfeit love. 
Friends, we cannot continue on pretending as though business as usual is okay because it's not okay. And, and the sad reality is that this morning, I've only talked about four of the arrows. The enemy wants to do everything he possibly can to pervert a good relationship, a godly relationship, through confusion, through comparison, through compromise, through counterfeit love. But the truth is, that's just four out of millions of arrows. So how do we guard against all the attacks against the enemy? Here's the encouragement that I want to leave for you or with you this morning. Psalm 46, 1, David wrote this. He said, God is our refuge and our strength. He's an ever-present help in trouble. When you feel like the, the arrows keep coming and they keep coming and the, the temptations and the attacks from the enemy keep coming, God provides a refuge for you. When you feel like you're weak and you feel like, I don't know if I can resist the temptations anymore, God provides a strength for you. When you are weak, he is strong and he is an ever-present help. When you feel like you are isolated, you feel like you're in a dark place, you feel like you can't get away anymore, is right when, when God reaches in and says, hey, you know what? I'm here to help you. I'm here to love you. I'm here to give you grace. I'm here to perhaps even rescue you. God has our back. He wants the best for us. He wants a fulfilling life for us. And even if that means he needs to go to battle for us, he needs to send out an army of angels for us, he's willing to do that to help us as an ever-present help in our times of trouble. Listen to the words of this song.
God wants the best for our relationships. We can trust him, we can believe him, we can follow him, but even in the moments where we get off track, he can rescue us and bring us back. Every time we, we go the wrong direction, God opens his eyes or his arms and he says, I, I will welcome you back, prodigal. You're welcome to come back home and I'm going to welcome you with a fattened calf and with a ring on your finger. I'm going to, I'm going to welcome you home with a hug and with love. I will rescue you when you feel like you're drowning. Friends, as we wrap up this series of love and war, I believe that the kind of love, the kind of relationships that God has created for us are worth going to war over. They're worth going to battle over. So my question that I leave you with is this. Are you willing to fight for your relationships? Are you willing to become a fighter? I believe that the love God intends for us to experience is worth fighting for. Let's pray. God, we come to you now and we confess the areas that we have not honored you. We have not trusted your ways and your path. Yet at the same time, Father, we are thankful for your grace, for your mercy, the fact that your mercies are new every single day, your grace of unforgived deservedness that or, or, or undeserved forgiveness that is, God, that you would, you would choose to offer us forgiveness that we can't earn, that we don't deserve. That you love us that much to rescue us, to help us. We thank you for your son, Father. The fact that he was willing to pay for the penalty that I deserve, that we deserve. Pay the cost on that cross to give us second chances, third chances, 50th chances, 700 chances. We thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. I pray for the married couples that are here this morning, that they would choose to serve the other person to the best of their ability, that they would not allow the enemy to have a foothold in their marriage, that they would put the needs of the other person above their own. I pray for the single people and the dating people, those who are perhaps even engaged, that they would be patient in your timing, that they would trust in the goodness of your word, and that they would choose to follow after what you say in your word as opposed to what their friends or perhaps what the world or what the enemy is saying. God, I pray that we're able to fight against the arrows that the enemy is shooting our direction, whatever those arrows may be, that they would, we would recognize the enemy warfare, recognize the fact that we're in a battle and we're in a war, but they're willing to fight with you, God, to preserve the integrity of who we are, that they would, we would desire the types of relationships that you created for us and to, to achieve that, to get that, that we would trust in your word. They would know your word, trust your word, and apply your word. God, we thank you for all that you do for us, and we thank you for the relationships you provided for us. It's in your son's name, in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.